America's number one national television program on Asia. This may look like a house that Laura could have lived in in Dr. Zhivago. But actually, I am in China, in a city of Harbin, once called the St. Petersburg of the East, as evidenced by architecture like this. Well, the Russians are gone now, but their cultural influence, as well as the influences of other nationalities that have settled here, continue to have an effect on this modern Chinese city. Tonight, we'll visit this culturally diverse city. and see the distinctive and even eccentric ways in which people here apply themselves to life and leisure. This is the Songhua River along whose banks the city of Harbin is built. The river is frozen rock solid in wintertime, but in the summer it attracts hordes of bathers who are here at the crack of dawn. And when I say bathe, I literally mean bathe. Suddenly, this idyllic scene is shattered by the blare of nearby loudspeakers. Michael Jackson and the latest dance music may not have caught on in China just yet, but the people here make do with what they can find. Usually locally recorded pop music or tapes from Hong Kong and Taiwan, and how they make do. Here at the rather inappropriately named Stalin Park, two to three hundred people gather each morning to do the Chinese equivalent of aerobic dancing. On weekend mornings, the attendance doubles. As a matter of fact, this scene can be found in playgrounds and parks every day all over the city. The amazing thing is that everybody joins in, from tiny tots to factory workers to grandmothers and professional people. On the Sunday morning we were there, even the president of the local university was among the 600 strong dancers. Even in the dead of winter, the Harbin people do their morning dance exercises in the open. And now here in the summer, we are presented with this astonishing spectacle. It certainly makes you wonder why people in this particular part of China have this strange affinity for dancing. Well, one explanation was offered by Mr. Gong Banhe, the mayor of Harbin. In Chinese history, all our minority groups have had an affinity for dancing. And Harbin has historically been a city with many ethnic groups. Also, there has been a great deal of Western influence. The fact is, Harbin's population of nearly 3.8 million is made up of 30 different ethnic groups. Included are the Chinese Han, Koreans, Mongolians, Russians, Sherpas, and of course, the Manchus. Harbin is the capital of Heilongjiang, one of three Chinese provinces that make up Manchuria. And even the city's name is derived from a Manchu word meaning very beautiful, very nice. Its proximity to Russia made it a natural target for Russian imperialist designs. So the city's Manchurian era came to an end at the turn of the century, during the last years of the Qing dynasty. The Qing government had so weakened that treaties were signed with Russia, making Harbin a virtual colony under Tsarist rule. The city became the headquarters for the building of a railway system that was eventually linked to the Trans-Siberian Railway. Even today, Harbin remains the most important railway terminus in northeastern China in most of what the province produces, including oil, timber, Coal and grain passes through here. 
In the 1920s, as many as 16 countries established settlements and had consulates here. So I think you can safely say that Harbin has always been an outgoing city. And in that era, the great cities of the world, such as New York, Berlin, Paris, all maintained trade and commerce with Harbin. Under those circumstances, our city was highly influenced by foreign cultures. And in terms of thought, we were quite progressive. In the 1930s, the city of Harbin entered its most tragic period when northeastern China was invaded by the militarist government of Japan. Tens of thousands of Chinese were killed under the cruel occupation of the Japanese in both concentration camps and in medical experiments on live humans. This museum officially designated the Memorial Hall for Northeastern Martyrs commemorates the heroic deeds of many who rose in resistance against Japanese occupation. Prominently featured is a beautiful young woman named Zhao Yiman, a famous communist firebrand and resistance fighter who was later incarcerated in this very building, which was then converted into a jail. She died at the hands of the Japanese at the age of 31 and is also commemorated by the statue less than 50 yards from the museum on the street that bears her name. Harbin was liberated by the Russians and the Chinese in 1945, and a monument dedicated to the bravery of the Russian soldiers still stands today in the heart of the city. Perhaps the most obvious reminder of Harbin's diverse cultural past is the architecture here. Even the most mundane structures bear strong Russian or European influences. Take this quaint-looking bus stop, or this extremely un-Chinese-looking eatery, or all these onion-domed buildings. These two turn-of-the-century buildings are popular movie locations because they reflect a style of Western architecture not commonly found in China. This was once the Moscow Commercial Center. Now it's the Heilongjiang Province Museum. This was once a Jewish bank. And this building is now a Korean middle school. But the shape and design of the windows and these prominent six-cornered stars seem to indicate that it was once something quite different. So no one we talked to could tell us just what. All over the city, there are buildings with Russian-styled roofs and balconies. But the place where European-influenced architecture is best preserved is Central Avenue. Here, the Palatial Hotel Modern bears a distinct early 20th century French flavor with its stately balconies and exquisite grill work. These obviously un-Chinese statues adorning the facade of a local bookstore, or this silver-domed department store, or this castle-like house now ensconced in the midst of modern high-rises, are just some of the architectural features that once earned Harbin the nicknames St. Petersburg of the East and Moscow of the East. And then there are the churches, the gigantic onion dome, Sticking out defiantly amidst more conventional structures belongs to St. Sophia's Church. Today, it's used only as a warehouse. However, there are other religious buildings which are more appropriately utilized. Services are still carried out at this mosque located in the old section of the city. Mass is also held regularly in this Catholic church. But nothing could have prepared us for what we saw at the local Protestant church one Sunday morning. While Christian missionaries and ministries were extremely active in this country during the first half of this century, religious practices have not been encouraged since the founding of the People's Republic and actually suffered severe persecution during the years of the Cultural Revolution. 
What is amazing about this particular Sunday service isn't just the fact that this little church with capacity for only a couple of hundred worshippers was filled to overflowing, so much so that scores of people had to make do observing the service outdoors through a public address system. What is amazing is the genuine show of faith and religious zeal we witnessed, especially among the old. One can only imagine the risks they took or the actual suffering they had gone through to keep their faith during the decade of the Cultural Revolution from 1966 to 1976. Religion is an important part of a people's cultural heritage. So our attitude towards religion is one of respect. We take a protective stance towards the freedom of worship. In the city of Harbin itself, the years of turmoil during the Cultural Revolution has done considerable damage to the religious institutions here. And what we have to do now is to restore respect and dignity to these religious institutions. A little further down the street from the Protestant church, we found a different story. This is a Ukrainian Orthodox church. Its Sunday attendance has dwindled from hundreds of people several decades ago to only a handful of old Russian and Ukrainian immigrants today. And one assumes that when they die out, so will the church. Many people are being Russian. Yes. Many Russian. people, Russian. many churches. Every house, every house. Chinese, a little, a little. The sad truth is, while Harbin remains an important center for foreign trade in China, in terms of population, it is much less of a cosmopolitan city than it used to be. Most of the foreign families who settled here in the 20s and 30s had left by the early 50s. One of the places where the remaining few stay is the retirement home for foreigners. This establishment was started in 1954, over a thousand foreigners have stayed here, although today there are only 20 residents. The average age is 74, and the oldest person here is 87. They are free to come and go as they please, and they live at the expense of the government. The home also contains a kindergarten, which is run by the workers here who use the facilities as a nursery for their own children. The retired foreigners also have a hand in looking after the tots. The current population at the home includes four Russians, five Koreans, three Japanese, and two stateless Americans. Marjorie Fuller, one of these Americans, explains. Well, we were in a camp for 21 years in Shanghai, and then they told us that there is a pe uh, home for foreigners in Harbin. There is no place for us in Shanghai. Well, no choice, we came here. My mother divorced my father. See? And uh, when we, I was about eight years of age, uh, my mother took out Chinese citizenship. And then uh, when the new people came in, in 1956, they removed us from us. They said, we don't recognize you as Chinese citizens. So I said, so that means <laughs> you don't recognize all the Chinese that went to Taiwan. It's finished. Yeah, sure, finish. They burn it up in front of me. And then, uh, so we were stateless Americans. And they put us in a place where they put all foreigners who were, well, who were not Soviet citizens. And there we stayed for 21 years. 